Well, there was one Father's Day where the LA Times said, of all the TV dads, who would you want to be your dad? I wasn't even on the list. <laughs> the next year they said, of all the TV dads, what TV dad was most like the dad you had? I was number one. So nobody wanted me, but everybody had me. <laughs> so here you go. Today is a truly special day. I'm sitting down with acting legend and TV dad to myself and many, the exceptionally kind and unbelievably talented Dan Loria. Dan and I are here at Hennessy Studios in North Hollywood recording at the Television Academy campus, where Dan will talk about his time overseas serving his country, how he went from a hometown sports hero to an acting legend, and his uncensored thoughts about the film industry. We'll chat about the impact his character Jack Arnold had on America in the hit TV show The Wonder Years, a no-holds-bar account of the show cancellation, and hear about his early days in the business working restaurant jobs with Bruce Willis and John Goodman. He's a true humanitarian and someone I can call friend. Dan, thanks so much for being here with me today. My pleasure. Uh, it means the world. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the story about how we connected. So my sons, uh, the whole reason why I'm here is I've got a, a, he's now 6, 17. He was 11 when we moved out here. From? We moved out here from Georgia. Georgia. Actually. Yeah, I don't hear any accent from, at all. From Georgia. No, I, I grew up in Long Island. We've got the whole yeah. Lindenhurst kind of connection yeah, yeah. here. That's what I thought. I was saying maybe I had something wrong here. Yeah. yeah. So the story is, is, so we ended, I sold everything uh, so that we can come out here. And I've got a, he was 10 at the time, my son, Zach, so he can pursue a young career in acting. Uh -huh. Right. So we we ended up out here, and he's been kind of going through the, all the auditions and all that fun stuff. Um, and it's been a couple of years, but the connection to you was, uh, he, for whatever reason, they ended up showing an episode of The Wonder Years in school. Oh yeah, they they still do. Yeah, yeah. In elementary school too. And so he 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 watched this episode, and he's like, "This is like the greatest show ever, right?" Uh -huh. And so he went home, and he literally binged watched every single like episode, right? A boy of excellent taste. Of course. <laughs> he was so into it. I'm like, well, why don't we go see the house where it was filmed? I hear it's in Burbank. And so we drove over there. The and, university place, right? Yeah. Yep. Drove over there and it looks just like the same thing. And uh, took a couple photos in front of it. And sure enough, I posted it on Facebook. And so after I posted on Facebook, I got a, a direct message from an old friend that I went to high school with by the name of Casey Riley. Oh, sure. Yeah. Casey. Right? Wow. Well, she's like my goddaughter. Yeah. yeah. Matter of fact, one of her sisters is my goddaughter. So. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. And so Casey's like, hey, that's Uncle Dan. Yeah. 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 Uncle Dan is, I think, in New York right now filming, but he lives in L.A. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe I could connect you two. Yeah, I went to high school with her dad, who I just talked to yesterday. So. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Huh. You know, you were so nice uh, to to speak with me and my son. If you remember, you and before COVID, you invited Zach and I over to your home. To watch an old movie, yep. We did. It was a boxing yeah. movie. Requiem for Every Weight. Yes. Yep. And, uh, and the thing that I love about that whole experience was, you know, being connected with you um, because you were like a you were like a TV dad to me, and I'm sure you were a TV dad to a lot of other people in this world. Yeah. Well, there was one Father's Day where uh, the LA Times said, "Of all the TV dads, who would you want to be your dad, real dad?" I wasn't even on the list. <laughs> <laughs> the next year they said, of all the TV dads, what TV dad was most like the dad you had? I was number one. Number one. So nobody right? wanted me, but everybody had me. See? <laughs> so you go. You know, and, so and that's a tribute to the writers. I love it. You know, and I and when I grew up, uh, like I didn't have a father figure. I had a grandfather and I had a uh, a grandmother and a mother who had me young. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was for people like me, we needed that. Yeah. Right? Well, we really did. Good writing. Shows you how powerful a medium can be when it wants to be. It really is. Um, and so when we went to your home, you know, this is surreal. I'm like, I'm sitting here with my TV dad watching, mm -hmm. uh, you know, old movies. And 
And, and the coolest thing about that whole experience was not only meeting all of your friends that were there. It seems like you do this on a regular basis. Yeah, before COVID, we did it every Sunday night. Right. Yeah. Um, but just how you, like, uh, deconstructed the art of acting Yeah. as we watched the movie. It's uh, becoming a forgotten art. Yes. It, it really is. And so, like, when, before I got there, I never watched movies that way. Yeah. No, and most people don't. No. No, and uh, I really think they don't know what they're missing. Mm -hmm. So this stuff about your generation uh, not being able to uh, sustain a full scene in one take, you know, they need that stimu stimulation, you know, that's got to be cut, 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 cut. That's that's uh, ridiculous. It's uh, yeah. It hasn't changed since the Greeks. No. If you tell a good story, people will listen. Sure, sure. You know, and when you do all that editing— no offense. <laughs> um, subliminally, your mind is taking out of the story. Mm -hmm. The reason why you can watch an old movie over and over again, like It's a Wonderful Life at Christmas and mm -hmm. still cry, is because Frank Capper is taking you off your couch and bringing you into Bedford Falls. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that if you cut on every line. Yeah. It just will not, it just doesn't grab your heart. Mm. And to watch some really great actors in new movies, sometimes it's embarrassing. Mm. And then you watch the same older version of that movie and you're sitting there with a tear in your eye and, and hearty, gut-wrenching laughs come out, you know. Wow. Um, just to give you one example... I don't think you can be a better actor than Morgan Freeman, Alan Arkin, and Michael Caine. Mm -hmm. And you watch the v modern, the newer going in style. It's almost unwatchable. Hmm. But watch the old one with George Burns, Lee Strasberg, and Art Carney. Sure. And I've showed it to those group of kids that come over and they go, this is so beautiful. And you see entire portions of the old one are not even in the new one. And their excuse is because they say your generation won't sit there that long. Well, they won't sit there that long for bad dialogue. That's right. A bad story, but they'll sit there for a good story. And I guarantee you, they will not st sit there for a bad story, regardless of who acts it. Mm-hmm. But they, they don't understand that. So. They don't understand it. No. Yeah. And it really hurts your generation as far as talent goes. Because a lot of good actors who are capable of doing a scene without the assistance of editing are now not getting hired because producers say we're going to cut on every line anyway. Mm -hmm. So half of acting has gone right there because nobody listens. I'm working with actors right now who cannot do two lines at a time. Hmm. They're not asked to, so they don't bother. They say, what's that line? They say it, and they know it's going to be cut. They feed it to them, and it's yeah. there. And mm -hmm. what I don't like about it most is there are some really good young actors out there. I work with them on stage, and they're being passed over for somebody who has more hits. It, yeah, the, more the yeah, followers, right? More followers, or because they're you know better looking and or whatever. But mm -hmm. the art of acting is not brought into the equation. And that, I think, hurts everybody. It definitely hurts writers. Sure. You know, they're afraid to write anything more than s a speech, more than four or five lines. Because nobody's going to deliver it. Well, nobody's going to deliver it, and they're going to cut it up anyway. They're going to cut it up anyway. Yeah. Mm. So that's really what I have young people come over to watch old movies. Or when I do my lecture at colleges, it's basically on that. Well, you, you allowed both Zach and I to kind of you know, watch a movie from a different perspective yeah, and, and appreciate the true art behind it. Yeah. Right. Especially when you're talking about some of these older movies. Oh yeah. 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 And uh, you know, I was fortunate because, you know, Charles Durning was my mentor and Jack Klugman and I got to meet a lot of the old actors, you know, and, and through the veterans foundation, you know, I, I, not that I acted with them, but, you know, I got to sit with um, James Stewart and, and you know, Robert Mitchum. Robert Mitchum even did a reading for a reading series once. Huh. And Rod Steiger. And, and you know, they, they were well aware of how the acting was being diminished yeah. each year we go on. 
Well, hopefully that will change. <laughs> well, I think you're seeing when a good young writer director gets to direct his own film in his final cut. You see the movies that get nominated, they're all the ones with long scenes without cuts. That's true. Right? They're not the the big blockbuster, of course, they gotta nominate because it makes money, but they usually don't win. It's well who's voting light. for it, right? Yeah. I mean the people that appreciate the art. Yeah. Right. That's so, why. Yeah. Mm hmm So there's still some hope. So you're a Long Island boy. Oh yeah. But born in Brooklyn. Wasn't everybody? Yeah, yeah, my grandpa was born in Canarsie. There you, you know? go. Uh huh. <laughs> and they ended up in. They ended up in. I went to Copac High School. I lived with my grandma and my grandpa. Right, that's where you met Casey. Right? Yeah, yeah, yep. Copac High School. Yeah, yep. I grew she, up Copac and then Lindenhurst. It's, it's yeah. the same, really. Right next door. But they're but big rivals, right? Mm -hmm. oh, Sports. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah, always. Uh -huh. I was always playing against my friends, one way or the other. Yep. You went to Lindenhurst High School. You, yeah. Graduated from there? Yeah, graduated from Leonardhurst and uh, went to Southern Connecticut. Okay. On football scholarship because I definitely didn't have the grades. Wow. Then I was in the Marine Corps for three years. And then I went to the University of Connecticut for my master's, which is in playwriting. Football. Now, did you kind of in high school think that you were going to pursue this acting? Like, Because I think about it, like, it's hard to get out of Lindenhurst. Yeah. <laughs> Right. And end up well, in Hollywood. Well, it was Hollywood. good life there, you know. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's very family oriented. You, your kids go to the same school that you went to. You buy bakery goods from the same, same bakery. people. Yeah, right? Right? And that's then their kind of sons it. and daughters. Yeah. yeah. That's how Long Island life is. Right. Yeah. And so most people don't have the courage to kind of get out of Long Island and unless you go to college. And then it sounds like that was part of your journey. But back in high school, did you have any, like, was there that whole acting bug at all? Uh, I had an aunt, my Aunt Adele, who lived with us for a while. Okay. And I think she was a frustrated actress, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd come home from practice and she'd say, while well, I'm eating dinner, she'd say, go to bed. Mm -hmm. So I'd go to bed real early. And at two o'clock in the morning, she'd wake me up and go, James Cagney. And we'd watch the late, late show, huh. you know, and I, so I loved old movies. Yeah. And then when I uh, got into college, uh, it was during spring football, I was telling a joke on the football field before practice. And this little old lady came over with her cane and tapped me on the shoulder pad and said, would you like to be in a play? And I said, you know, I always wanted to try that. And okay. she said, I know. And I said, how would you know? And she said, because I'm the greatest acting teacher in the world. And it was Constance Welsh who started the Yale Dramat, but ended her teaching career over at Southern Connecticut, which was right down the block from Yale. Huh. And uh, she dragged me over to the theater department. And, you know, as far as I was concerned, it was just like playing ball. So I loved it. Yeah. And uh, even while I was in the service, uh, in the Marine Corps, one of her first students was James Whitmore, who, after studying with her, went into World War II, and she would, as a Marine, and would send him plays. So when I was in, she sent me plays to read while I was overseas. Wow. She kept in touch with you, huh? Yeah. So then when I came out, I was going to go to... Uh, so you know, graduated the, UConn. Not well, UConn. then I, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I, I was going to go right into the city, but I wrote a play and I won a grant to the University of Connecticut. So I went and got my MFA. So when you um, went to college, your football scholarship, you did all four years you, or did you end up leaving a little bit earlier? No, no, no. I did actually four and a half. Four yeah. and a half years. And yeah. then from there you got drafted into the Marines? Or no, did you I went go in, in as, uh, no, it's not ROTC for Marines, called PLC. Okay. And uh, I, I went in as an officer. I got it. So you did your... You your, know, Long Island. We all, all our parents were in World War II. Sure. Regardless of what my thoughts were about the war, you just felt you had to go. So... You sure did. Like and, Casey's dad, John, he went, you know, we all went. Yeah. So, um, and it's interesting because tying it back to Long Island, and you mentioned your military career, you mentioned football, you mentioned, um, so Neil Marlins and Carol Black. Right. Neil went to, uh, uh, well, it's Walt Whitman High, but it was South, uh, South Huntington when I was there. We were big rivals. Yeah. 
Uh-huh. I was older than Neil. So, but when I was at Lindenhurst, we were the top dogs on Long Island. We won everything. Sure. But when he was at uh, Walt Whitman, they won everything. So we were always battling Bad back and forth. before each yeah. other. I love it. Yeah. And then for those that are listening, they were the, the writers of, uh, yeah. of Wonder Years. Yeah. I met them when they were on uh, Growing Pains. Wow. And Neil and I, we, well, we just you know, hit it off mm -hmm. and all that rivalry from high school. <laughs> but it's Great guy, great writer. Him and, and Carol really, you know, they created that. They were there for the first 18 episodes and really created a great show. And then Bob Rush came, mm -hmm. came in and he was the head writer and he really maintained the foundation that they had created. Hmm. So I want to know a little bit more about that, right? So, because he grew up, and I think if I my uh, research is correct, they wanted this setting of the Wonder Years to be in Huntington. They originally. never say that on the show. Okay. They, you know, they never mention where the Wonder Years is, but there's so many clues. Yeah. The, the jet jacket. For one, that Fred always wore. Okay. Every time we mention a street name, it's something from Long Island. Jericho Turnpike, Sunrise it, Highway, right? Montauk Highway. Uh -huh. You know, so there are enough indications to say it was pretty much Long Island. And so when they're casting for this part of Jack, right, walk me through that. Well, that is uh, the only reason why I really got the Wonder Years was because of Joanna Kearns. I was on Growing Pains. That's where I met Neil and Carol. And then uh, the following year, I did another Growing Pains. And like I said, Neil and I just hit it off. Long Island guys. And then the Wonder Years came up. And my agent couldn't get me in. And Joanna Kern said, you ought to call Neil. He loves you. You know, he'll get you. And I said, no, nah, it's so unprofessional. I want to do it. But Joanna Kearns called the casting director and the casting director mentioned my name to Neil and he went, Oh yeah, Dan, he'd be perfect. So that's how I got in. And I just auditioned with everybody else. But you know, to be honest, I think I had a leg up because of Long Island. There, there is. There yeah, is. And I looked a little bit like Neil's dad. Huh? So that oh, helped. okay. Yeah. Because when you think about it, it's like a show from Long Island, right? You've yeah. got a dad that has a military background. It's right. like, for the most part, you're kind of just going to be playing yourself. Well, right? I, there's a lot of different, but I think the only contribution I made as far as the writing is concerned was um, when we were working on the pilot, Neil and I were just sitting there and he goes, Dan, is there anything you think we could do for this character? And I said, well, I'm a Marine. It's not going to hurt if somewhere along the line we mention he's a veteran. Mm -hmm. And the very next day, Neil said, I talked with Carol last night and we're going to make you a Korean War vet. You can't be a Vietnam War. It wouldn't have fit the time I understand. frame. He said, but we're going to make you a Korean War vet and you're going to be a Marine. And a couple of times that came in. To, but other than that, I, I, you know, the writing was so, uh, I'm, I'm really big about writing. Yeah. There were very few times I said, oh, could I say this instead of that? I think in the whole 130 shows, I might have said that two or three times. Wow. Uh -huh. You know. And wasn't there a story about, uh, I guess, Fred Savage, like really wanting you to be his dad on the show? Oh, I didn't know Fred before the show. Oh, you didn't? No, okay. no. We became very close afterwards. I, you know, still talk to him. I'm prob I, ironically, I'm probably closer to Danica okay. than anybody. I see her all the time. We've worked together. We do a lot of readings together. And through the entire 130 shows, I only had one line to Danica. Wow. I would talk about her to Fred a lot. Yeah. But we only, she said, good evening, Mr. Arnold. And I said, and that hi, Winnie. And that was it. That was the only lines we have to get. Wow. You know, I don't think I would have ever thought that in like hindsight, thinking, looking right. back at, at being yeah, a Yeah, because fan many of the, of the conversations that I had with Fred were about girls and Danica. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting because uh, like that show, I, like one of the things that really made that show stand out um, was because of the adult version narrator. Right. Mm -hmm. Daniel Stern, I believe. Was yeah. Daniel Stern was the narrator. Initially, it was gonna, going to be Ari Gross. Okay. And, uh, and then when they put the pilot together, they went with a little older voice. Mm. And Danny did. And Danny directed a number of them. Yeah. He, he doesn't act very much now because he is a uh, brilliant 
brilliant sculptor. Okay. And uh, he's doing very well and he's a great guy. And I think my son and even my, like one of my favorite movies is Stand By Me, right? Yeah. And that's kind of the same kind of. There's, a, there's been right? a lot. They, yeah, they say this, uh, oh, the show was copied from this and that, but you can go all the way. If you know anything about old movies. No, I just, like, I'm just saying know. like having that narrator, right? Yeah, tell the but the story. narration has been around forever. You know, matter of fact, try to sell a script today with a narrator on. They say narrators don't work and I can give you millions of them that work. You know, even Shawshank Redemption has a narrator and that was. It, it does. Another great movie, right? Yeah. In the closing monologue of Wonder Years, and I'll read it here, it says, growing up happens in a heartbeat. One day you're in diapers, the next day you're gone. But the memories of childhood stay with you for the long haul. I remember a place, a town, a house, a lot like other houses, a yard lot, a lot like other yards, on a street a lot like other streets. And the thing is, after all these years, I still look back with wonder mm -hmm. how great to close out a show like that tell me that's not great writing it it's amazing writing so you're right now you're storytelling mm -hmm. and if i cut from your face to my face to your face from my face everything you said would be lost it would become very technical so true so just a curious question so the the characters Right. So I know Jack and died in the show. Yeah. Right? That, that was actually supposed to be the end of the show. The last episode we, we were, we should have never been canceled. We wanted to do one more season. So the show would end with Fred graduating high school. Uh, and then we're about to plan our uh, honeymoon my, uh, that we never really had mm -hmm. uh, me and Allie. Yeah. And on the day Fred gets accepted to college, he comes home and finds me dead on the floor from mm -hmm. a heart attack. And that's the end of the Wonder Years. Because Fred, I mean, uh, Neil's dad passed away while they were playing tennis. So it was all, and we were 27 out of 166 shows and we were canceled. Wow. Because of one man, Ronald per Perlman, the man who owned uh, Revlon. Is that right? Yep, bought the show and sold off everything that New World had, and he tried to rob ABC. And even Bob Iger, who said to me that even if he had stayed, he wouldn't have been able to save the show with this guy. So I'm telling you now, if I'm ever in a room with him, one of us is coming out. I wouldn't bet on him. Oh, boy, I wouldn't want to yeah, be and there Yeah, and you can either. say that anywhere you want. It's been in print. You don't have to edit it out. So it's, that was unfair you know, to end it, that show when it did. It was unfair to the public. And all the actors and even the Teamsters were willing to not take the raise that we were due just to do 12 more so we could end the show the proper way. And everybody feels that way. Uh, well, I do. I, I'm not going to speak for anybody else, yeah. but I can tell you there are a few who feel the same way. Well, all the fans do. Oh, definitely. There, there right. was no reason not to do at least 12 more. Yeah. Matter of fact, the quote, and I'm getting this right, the amount of profit did not warrant another season. And Ted Turner bought the, distri the distribution rights. Mm -hmm. He said, I'd buy 100 more. He was great about it. So w w on that note, the the fictional characters, right? W like, what do you think if it was real life, what would they be doing today? The, the real characters? Yeah, the characters. Well, my We're, character's gone. Your character's uh, gone. I know from what the writers told me, uh, Allie was going to get remarried. Okay. And uh, Fred ends up having kids and living across the street from Winnie Cooper, who's married and has is kids. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And Josh is still the best friend and becomes probably the most successful of all of them, you know, huh. business-wise. So I think that was... I, I have always thought they should have done... Fred as a father with a couple of kids. Yeah. And you hear an, a voiceover. And at night, he comes out and looks through the telescopes. And there I am as a ghost swinging on the swing saying, see, you thought I was a jerk. You're doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that would have been a great idea. But I'm, I'm glad they're doing a new. I want to talk years. about that, too. Yeah. yeah. No, I, uh -huh. I, I don't know what took him so long. I know the failure of knockoffs, mm -hmm. I think, delayed it. Okay. But the knockoffs made, uh, well, like Brooklyn Bridge, great show, G good actors. But there is this kernel in those shows 
that makes the young kid smarter than the adults in mm. all situations. Whereas the Wonder Years ended with more than half the shows, the narrator saying, if I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have done that. Hmm. And that's why it's a great teaching lesson. That's why we started this conversation with them showing it in schools. Yeah. And that was the difference with the ones that don't make. And I and I don't think they'll make the mistake with this new Wonder Years because Neil and Marlins and Fred are involved. Sure. And I think they're going to say, hey, look, the kid's going to be wrong. Yeah. You know? And this is an, an it, it actually airs, I believe, in September. The, the, yeah. The I, first episode. Yeah, they've been, I haven't, you know, I just sent them a congratulations. And yeah. I told them if you need a Sicilian uncle, give me a call. Well, I was going to ask you, <laughs> a, a cameo appearance? I, possibly. I'm yeah. sure, I'm sure Fred and Neil, if, uh, if they feel bringing some of us on will help. Yeah. And it'll be well written. Uh -huh. You know, but if they think it'll detract from the storyline, uh, perhaps it's best to keep them separate. Sure. So you have such a um, an amazing uh, IMDb, right, with all of the work that you've it's done over nice the years. nice way of saying I'm old, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Keep going. Well, this will be good, right? Well, it's, it'll be your, your memory test here, right? So oh, I don't know half of these things. I wanna, I'm going to play a game with you Oh, here. please don't. Right? Because I don't... I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I told you, my mentor was Charles Durning. The big thing was never look back. I, is, is that right? Yeah, when somebody asked me, what was the best thing you have ever done? I'll tell you, you right now. You don't the look next back. One. Okay. The next one. Well, and, and that makes sense because I really ever like go back and listen to these podcasts. Like, did you do that? Did you watch the wonder years no i'm uh i'm one of those actors i i i don't like to watch myself i think okay. i've seen every wonder years that i'm not in okay i've seen very few that i'm in got it well i'll just start with some of the uh so the movie stakeout 1987 yeah that was a lot of fun which character did you play I don't remember the character's name, but I was uh, Forrest Whitaker and I were the cops that watched the house during the day. Okay. And uh, Richard Dreyfus and Emilio Estevez watched it at night. And I know the dog that I had, I remember his name, Winston. You know, I said to Forrest, that dog's getting paid more than we are. <laughs> and Forrest just said, because he can pee on cue and we can't. So. <laughs> Well, you, you were Phil Kolchank. Phil Kolchank. Yeah, that sounds Phil right. Phil Kolchank. Yeah. And then I was the police, the head detective in Stakeout 2. Okay. Who'd you play in Growing Pains? Uh, well, the first one, I played a hockey coach. Brockton. Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> and the second one, I was a passenger on a plane. Uh, and my wife was going to have a baby, I think. Yeah. I remember the plot lines. I don't really remember the names. And I'll give you an easy one to end it here. What about Sullivan and Son? Oh, hey, well, I was mm -hmm. Sullivan and, yeah. Jack Sullivan. Yeah, that was, you know, that was, uh, I got to tell you, I got to be honest with you. That was like robbing the bank. Yeah. I had to back up to get my check, put my <laughs> hand behind me. And I never laughed so much in my life. Brian Murray and Steve, and we, there were four stand-up comics. You couldn't say a line without five guys jumping on it. Uh -huh. And uh, Jamie Widow's directing. And, of course, Jody and I were, you know, and Christine Ebersol. They were the best. You know, it was just all we did was laugh. You got to remember when you do a sitcom, on Monday we come in and read the script and all the writers laugh and the executives laugh. But you know, as you're reading it, half of this isn't going to be shot. Yeah. So then we walk over to the set. We have lunch. We fool around. And then usually some exec walks over and says, go home. They're going to rewrite. Then you come in on Tuesday, you sit around the table, you read it, you get up on your feet and you know half of it's not going to be there. Hmm. And then you come in Wednesday and it's not, well, okay, three quarters of this might stay. And then Thursday you block it out and then Friday you shoot it. And yeah. you shoot it twice with live audiences. You know, they've got 12 different camera angles. I mean, you, yeah. it's just robbing the bank. But it was, it, I never laughed so much in my life. And Steve, uh, he was a sweetheart. Uh, just great people. It's nice to see you light up when you talk about that. It, oh, it just, yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, Vince and uh, Peter Billingsley, 
uh, matter of fact, Peter Billingsley was the original boy in A Christmas Story. It's, oh, okay, and yeah. And they produced A Christmas Story to musical, and that's why I got to do the Broadway play. Hmm. So it was all because of Peter and that. So it, it was just, I didn't even have to audition. Steve and Peter saw me do Lombardi. They said, you want to play? Actually, they wanted me to be the bigot at the bar. Mm -hmm. And I said, listen, guys, I'm still a dad from the Wonder Years. <laughs> and if I do that realistically, it might hurt you. Yeah. And then they called back and they said, why don't you be Sullivan? And I said, if you can buy me as an Irishman, I'm in. So it, it's interesting that you say that, like I'm the dad as the wonder years, right? You think that hurt your career later? Uh, all those things, for everything you gain, you lose. For everything you lose, you gain. You know, like when I do a, a play, especially in a regional theater, a lot of people come, especially people of your age or maybe saw it originally or are now showing their kids, they will come to the play. And then it's my job after the first 10 minutes to make sure they're not still looking for the data to one year. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, uh, it, it, you know, I, I, people say that, but uh, on stage, it doesn't hurt at all. It doesn't. And I want to talk about the stage stuff too. What's your, uh, so I'm sure back in, uh, when the show was being filmed, you probably got recognized everywhere you went. It was probably, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. When anybody's on a hit TV show, even now they'll go, yeah, the dad from the one. You years. still, you still yeah. get it, huh? In New, in New York City, I like it because I'll be walking down the street and a cab driver will yell, hey, coach, because they went to see Lombardi, you know. <laughs> so, but that's that's fine. You know, I never understood actors who get upset because people bother. Well, what do you that's think was going to happen? That's what you for. Right? Yeah. That's, you know. Yeah. And I got it. And, and I'll tell you the truth. Like any, I mean, I always end my uh, lecture at colleges with this. Our business is like any other business. 15% mm -hmm. of the people I work with are total assholes. And 85% are just the nicest people who are, regardless of what the writing is, are trying to do the best they can to give the audience what, what they, they want. want. Mm -hmm. You know, and I can go on and on with great example. I like my dear friend, Joe Montaigne. Yeah, he's on a show that's very formula, you know. Every week he's saying, but Joe will work just he wants to give the audience the best, even though it's almost the same thing every week. Mm -hmm. And he's such a good actor. And I think the audience appreciates that. And sure. he tries to convey that to the younger people that work with him. And the difference between our business, though, we promote the 15%. Another business would be promoting the 85%. That's, that's true. You know, you wreck a hotel room, you're all over the paper. Uh huh. Yeah. It's, it's true. Would you consider yourself more of a, of a stage actor? Is that more of your passion? Uh, yeah. I mean, that, that's not even close. It's not even close. No. Yeah. I mean, television is, it's really not acting, it's editing. Yeah. And it's getting further and further away from acting. I mean, when I started, if you watch, I did eight Cagney and Lacey's with Tyne Daly. I, we, I bet you more than half our scenes don't have a cut in them. Hmm. I mean, you work with Tyne. Why would you? It's great writing. And now we do four or five minute scenes without a cut. Now you can't do two lines with them. So that's not acting. Yeah. I mean, even if it is, even if you create a connection with somebody, I, I, I don't think, especially the producers, understand that chemistry is what happens between two actors. As soon as I cut from your head to my head, what we've cut is the chemistry. Mm -hmm. So on stage, when that curtain goes up, you better be able to carry the freight. You know, I mean, I was I, you know, something like Lombardi. I had 286 performances and, you know, I'm with Judith Light. Boy, you better be good. And that went a little, lot longer than you guys anticipated. Lombardi, oh, they said right? we wouldn't run 10 weeks because uh, we were two TV stars. We weren't movie stars. Huh. And uh, we ran 11 months. Wow. But you better have, you better be able to carry the freight. You're going to step on the stage with Judith Light. She, you know, she's like Wendy Malick, Priscilla Lopez. These people are good. They're good. Yeah, you know. It's like batting against Sandy Koufax. You, you better <laughs> you get better, up there and start swinging, you, you pal. Be good, yeah. right? Yeah. No. Well, that was the question I was going to ask. Is it hard to make it in California or New York? And it sounds like New York. Mm. 
Uh, I can't answer that now because it's changed so much. See, it was much easier for me than it is for the younger kids. We just had to learn how to act. Mm -hmm. So we got jobs as waiters. I washed dishes. From, I worked at a place called uh, uh, Cafe Central, and Bruce Willis was the bartender. I washed dishes. Is Eddie right? O'Neill uh, washed dishes right around the corner at O'Neill's Balloon, would come over and have drinks at night, and John Goodman was the doorman. What? Yeah. It almost sounds like a show. Yeah, and we were all doing uh, plays where we didn't get paid. Huh. You know, I think John Goodman probably did better than all of us because most people don't realize that he, he can sing. He He's in the original cast of Big River. He had a great voice, plus he did commercials. Most of us were, you know, doing these plays, half of which were terrible, terrible. But, you know, not getting paid, but we were learning our craft, you know. And making all the connections and networking yeah, and, and you, right? whatever you had to do, you know. That's half the battle, getting yeah. out there. What uh? What is one maybe like a big regret that you have in in your careers? Any movies or oh, TV this. shows that you turned down? Like, what's some of the bigger regrets? Nah, none of that stuff is because you know when they say, "Oh, you turned down," I didn't. I was never a big enough star to turn down things. Mm -hmm. It just sometimes I wasn't available, and you wished you were because that was a hit. But. Yeah. Uh, um, I still write a lot. and I've had a play up off Broadway a couple of years ago. I got another one coming up. But I have always regretted um, I lost my literary agent early in my career, and it was my fault. And I've always regretted that. Hmm. So I've had to work twice as hard to get things. But I should have. Uh, Susan Shulman is her name. She's a great literary agent. But I disagreed about something, and I was young, and I was like, no, I'm going to do it my way. And Right. That was a big mistake. Well, Acting-wise, you know, I, I have no regrets. Mm -hmm. you know, so, I mean, I would have liked to have done, <laughs> I'd like to be Tom Hanks. You know? <laughs> now, that's, now, see, that that's a perfect example of what I was talking about. I, I did Earth to the Moon. I didn't get to act with Tom Hanks, but uh, he directed the two episodes I did. And you hear all these stories about how nice Tom Hanks is. Well, I'm going to tell you now, he's even nicer. Is he? Yeah. yeah. Great guy. Great. It really cares about what he's doing, too. Well, another nice actor. So uh, so my son, uh, you know, I was being like the acting dad, right? I was taking my son to the auditions, uh -huh. and a lot of rejection, you know, a lot of rejection. And so we just got done with an audition. We went over, we were in Beverly Hills and we went to get some, uh, was it Nate and Al's? Nate the, and Al's, sure. Nate and Al's, yeah. right? Eating some matzo ball soup and feeling kind of back home in New York, right? And uh, and so once we get out of there, we walk out and there's like a coffee shop next door and we walk in and I look up. I'm like, and I show Zach. I'm like, that's John Travolta. Oh, yeah. Right? And Zach lights up because he's like, he's like an old soul. Sure, soul, Saturday. Right? Yeah. And, and so uh, he's like, and so he meets like once ago, I'm like, no, 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 he's in a meeting. He's sitting down. Don't do that yet. Right. And everybody's aware that John Travolta is in the room. Oh, sure. Right. Sure. But nobody, it's it's not really polite to interrupt. Right? right. There's etiquette, I guess. So, so anyway, he gets up and my son immediately runs over to John Travolta, <laughs> right? This 11 year old kid. And then John's like, and I'm like stumbling because he's going to ask him to take a photo with, right. with John. Right. You don't get a chance to see John anywhere. And so I'm stumbling and he's like, relax. He tells me, he's like, relax. It's okay. He's like, yeah. Hey, I'm, yeah. I'm John. Oh, sweet. Nice, man. nice to meet you. Like, yeah. what's your name? And what's your name? Tell me a little what you're an actor. Tell me. And he stood there for like 20 minutes with us. Oh yeah. Talking. No. Yeah. And, and no, that, see, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be surprised about that because you know, one of the reasons why he's been around this long, even though he had a big slump period for a while, is it's one of the easiest people to work with. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just a good man, a good artist. I, I don't know him personally. I met him a couple of times, and he just was everything I was told. He's a nice guy. As a matter of fact, he was asking me about some old movies. Is that right? Yeah, the one time we talked for a few minutes. Uh-huh. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of them like that. Brian Cranston? Psh. I, I, I did this thing where I asked celebrities to do these videos and tell a story to help regional theaters save live. I, I'll show it to you on my phone. Okay. I have 72 of them. And you won't believe the people that are. Lou Diamond Phillips, Brian Kranz. Wow. You know, just Judith, just name after name. Uh, Alfred Molina, Tony Shalhoub. 
And everybody says, how'd you get these big names to do that for nothing? I said, I asked them. That's it. I said, you want to help the theater? Yeah, I'm in. You know, they usually know when I call, oh, Dan, what the hell do you want now? You know, See? I, see yeah. I said, come on, I got an idea to say. We've raised almost $4 million. Wow. You know, to help regional theaters. You have the power to create a future that wasn't going to exist anyway. Yeah. Well. Right. We've got to hang on to the theater somehow. Yeah. We're in bad straits right now. So as a kid, like growing up uh, again on Long Island, uh, I'd go to bed and and I'd fall asleep. And we had a small little apartment in my grandparents' house. And uh, every night I'd fall asleep to two shows. Right. And so the Honeymooners. Oh, the bet. You want one, to talk about not editing? One of my favorite, <laughs> seriously, one of my favorite shows of all time to this day. And notice how little editing is. And that's live. That's live. Right. Yeah. Art Carney. Oh, yeah. You oh. had to have Patty McCormick on here. And when Patty McCormick was the bad seed when she was 10 years she old. She was at your house that yes. night when we went. I would you love should, to do that. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you her number. Okay. She would, because these kids, like Fred, he didn't couldn't understand Fred Savage. What do you mean live? I said, Fred, there was no videotape. <laughs> when you were doing it, it was in their living room. What if something went wrong? Too bad. <laughs> you know? Right. But the honeymoon is a perfect example. Yeah. You know, now they screw up all the time, but they knew how to cover it. So there was good. no cue cards. So good. Yeah. So that I love that was again one of my what favorite shows. Other? And then the odd couple. Oh, Jack. Yeah. yeah and that's so, why I wanted to transition to that. So. Oh, no. That Jack. Uh, now, Charles Durning, I knew from the first day I went into New York City and mm -hmm. for 40 something years. Jack, it was just the last 10 years of his life. Um, we worked on uh, Rescue Me, I think it was in New York. And we had a great scene together. And he grabbed me and goes, uh, I hear you're a theater nut. And I said, yeah, sure. So he says, I want you to come to the Coconut Grove in Miami, and we're going to do the price. Okay. And I said, Jack, I do not do old plays. The last line of my bio is, Dan doesn't do plays by old dead white guy. <laughs> and he goes, no, no, don't give me that. I need you. You got to be. I said, all right, I'll make you a deal. If I do this play with you, you got to do two new plays. Ah, oh, Jesus. All right. So I went down, we got good reviews. We became very, very close. And he did do the two new plays. Is that right? And, yeah. And one of them was The Value of Names mm -hmm. by Jeffrey Sweet. And Jack always said it was the best play he ever did. It's about the House on American Activities Committee, but it's a three-hander. Um, and, you know, he was very much involved with that. He was at John Garfield's apartment. They were reading through... Golden Boy, the revival. Okay. John Garfield's in the original, but he's not the Golden Boy. Mm -hmm. But in the revival, he's the Golden Boy. And there was a knock at the door. And Jack, being one of the youngest guys here, uh, John Garfield's real name was Julie. He said, Jack, get the door, will you? When Jack opened, there were two men from the government hmm. to serve the subpoena. Hmm. And I said, Jack, what, what did Garfield do? He says, well, John came up and said, thank you, guys. Would you like a drink? And one of them said no and walked away. And the other one said, uh, thank you. Anyway, Mr. Garfield, I wish you the best of luck. I'm a fan and walked away. Hmm. And John Garfield turned around to the crowd and said, guys, we cannot rehearse here anymore. I'll see you at the theater. Please don't come over because they're going to be following me. Wow. And they were and they did. This is something most people don't realize. <clears throat> I was doing a Christmas story on Broadway, and I was literally in the hospital room when Charles Durning, like I said, he was like my dad, mm -hmm. and he passed away. And I went back to the theater. There was no way I wasn't going to go on. Charlie would have came out of the clouds and killed me. And the guy playing Santa Claus walked in, and he said, what's the matter? You saw I was upset. And I said, Charles Durning passed away. I have to call Jack Klugman. And let him know. Because we we would go to dinner. Dom DeLuise, Peter Falk, Jack Klugman, Charlie Durning, and me. We'd go to dinner at least once a month. And as I said, I got to call Jack Klugman. My phone rang, and it said Jack Klugman. And I didn't even say hello. I just said, how did you know? And Jack's wife said, know what? And I said, well, Peggy, I was just going to call you to let you know Charlie Durning passed away and I heard her drop the phone on the floor and she picked it up and said, I was calling you to tell you Jack passed away. Oh, they passed God. away four hours apart on Christmas Eve. 
Wow. So I called Paul Lieber, who's in charge of all the Broadway PR stuff. And I said, Paul, is there any way we could dim the lights on Broadway one night for Jack and Charlie? And it was this long pause. And then Paul said, no, we're going to pause it two nights. And it's the only time in the history of Broadway the lights were dimmed two nights in a row. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I could see the emotion. I, I could see the emotion. Yeah. It was good night. Wow. Yeah. Being around those guys, talking about acting. Phew. <laughs> you, been, you step on the stage with Charlie Dern and, you, and, and those guys, Peter and them. And they, and they were very opposite. Dom and Charlie were a lot alike. Uh -huh. Very much like I am. We always had fun acting. And Peter and Jack, oh, I'll tell you, they'd worry about everything. I mean, Peter, would, just even in a reading. Dan, is it funnier if I move the water bottle here or should I move it over here? You know, Pete, just move the bottle. <laughs> Charlie Dirty one night, he said, Pete, facting was that hard. Dan and I wouldn't do it. <laughs> well, it's nice that you found a core group of friends out here. Well, it was mentors. Yeah, friends. basically through Charlie. And then uh, when the Wonder Years was a hit, Charlie said, all right, what are you going to do for the theater now? You know, the old cranky old Irish guy. Come on, come on. We got to do something for the theater. Yeah. So I produced a couple of plays, and one of them was Bronx Tale. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, De Niro, you know, bought the rights from us. And then— Didn't Chaz have something to do with that, too? Well, Chaz and uh, Frankie Ranzulli wrote it. Okay. And then, well, I mean, I didn't have—I did the initial play, not the movie. I got it. I mean, I'm, yeah. they had to buy it from us. So Charlie said, I said, I don't want to produce plays. It's not what I do. So Charlie talked me into starting a reading program where every Monday night we read a new play to help writers get literary agents. Hmm. And we were going to do one a month. That lasted for six months. And then we did two a month for the next six months. Then we did one a week for 10 years. 70 writers got literary agent. But because of Charlie, Joe Montaigne, Wendy, Malik, we were able to get the biggest stars to come read. And this poker game that I was in. And the audience would be Sid Caesar, Rod Steiger, yeah. Mel Brooks sometimes, and, and Ann would come. Usually when Charlie read, they would be out there. And, uh, you know, it was just one rehearsal. And uh, you rehearse on Sunday. You read it Monday night. Mm -hmm. and, and we just, I loved doing it. It was a lot of work. You're changing people's I went broke lives. doing it, but I loved it. <laughs> well, you're changing people's lives, right? Helping them find their literary agents. Yeah, and, I was yeah. making some great contacts with writers. For sure. You know, a lot of the guest spots I get now, I walk on and say, somebody says, remember me? I wrote a play you did a reading of. I go, oh, yeah, good. <laughs> Thanks for paying me back. <laughs> See, right? It's nice to get those uh, those connections. Yeah. So I've, I've also, uh, so you never had any children. No, no. However, you were National Big Brother of the Year. 1972. I'm on my uh, sixth little brother. Yeah, huh? Yeah, it's a great program. And uh, they lie a little bit to you. Do they? Yeah, the big brother says you only have to pick them up once every two weeks for a couple of hours. Okay. That ain't going to happen. No. Once the kid falls in love with you, you, you fall in love with you. Yeah, right? and the, you know, my current one, Julian, um, he's got two more years and then the bills were over. But I paid through his uh, his education. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. sure. Huh. You get close. Two of them end up working on the Wonder Years. One of them just retired, my friend, uh, my little brother, Glenn. Is that Wade. right? Yeah, got him a job on the Wonder Years. And uh, after 25 years, he's retiring as a grip. See, you made yeah. a lot of impacts on a lot of lives. Yeah. No, that's big brother. I was, I recommend Big Sister. I mean, you can't have a better program. Yeah. You know, it's it actually, you benefit more than the kid in a lot of ways. I could totally see that. Now, you also, one of the things that I admire most about you is your military. You know, thank you so much for, for your service. Yeah, it was my honor. I was also a vet. I did four oh. years in the United States Air Force. Air Force. Yep. Denny Franz was in the Air Force. Yep. I got, uh, I right out of high school. That's how yeah. I left Long Island. Ah. Right. Joined the Air Force, ended up uh, in Texas, uh, Lackland Air Force Base, did my boot camp, ended up in uh, in Vegas, of all places. It was the home of the Thunderbirds. Right. Oh, okay. So I'd wake up as a young 18 year old kid in a dorm room and there's like 
you know, air shows happening all day, right? And just seeing these F-16s and stuff. Then I got a chance to go to uh, Italy for a little bit. Got to see the homeland. Oh, that's, I never saw any of that. So. <laughs> no, did that for like three months and came back. Um, but uh, it was uh, it was awesome. And so, uh, but you 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 contribute a lot still to the veterans well, I do associations the, uh, and stuff. toys for tots. I do the voiceover for that. And whenever the you know uh, my company commander when I was overseas. Then Captain Fulford, okay. Carl Fulford, became a four-star general. It was the only time in the history of the Marine Corps they had three four-star generals. It's always the commandant, the assistant commandant. But he was put in charge of all Marines in Desert Storm. He was actually in a room when Colin Powell said, you break it, you own it. Hmm. One of the finest people I've ever He still comes to my plays when I do a play. and Great guy. But whenever he calls and says, hey, we need you. Come here. I'm there. You know. You got to go. Of course you you, you know. Yeah. You serve, you got to go. I'll tell you a, a good military service. Uh, in the National Veterans Foundation, we would have a, these monthly meetings. And, you know, Cesar Romero was there and Charlton Heston and, and General Stewart, Jimmy Stewart. Mm -hmm. I could never call him Jimmy or <laughs> I'd call him General. <laughs> I just couldn't get it out. Um, but one night he was in the Army Air Corps because there was no Air Force then. So he says, um, I invited uh, somebody I served with to come to the meeting tonight. He worked on my plane in World War II. Hmm. He was a young kid then. And we said, sure, General. Great. Glad to meet him. About 10 minutes later, Walter Matthau walked in. Is that right? He worked <laughs> on Jimmy Stewart's aircraft wow. as a mechanic. Funny how life kind of reconnects with you. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Later. No, Jimmy Stewart was, you know, he had 36 missions. Um, a lot of them served, but didn't see combat, you know, yeah. um, but Henry Fonda and Jimmy Stewart, they were major stars who actually went into combat. Even, even Clark Gable had six combat missions, huh. you know, so it's so a different time. It it's is her own power. Oh yeah. Yeah. So my, my son recently, uh, just a couple of days ago, like, I guess they gave the list of, uh, you know, seniors, because he's going to be a senior this year in high school. Um, and so he got that call from the recruiter. Did he really? He got yeah. the call from the recruiter, right? And so, you know, my son knows that I was in Air Force. And he never, they don't really talk about that too much, right? You know, I try to bring that up sometimes. But, and so the recruiter got his ear for like 30 minutes and was telling him all about the, you know, the, the military and this and that. And so now my son's got an interest, right? Yeah. And so I'm like, He's asking me all these questions. So uh, I, I I sat down and watched uh, Full Metal Jacket with yeah. him. Yeah. Army. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not big on that one. No. Huh? You know, nobody's <laughs> going to make me walk out in the open singing Mickey Mouse. If you think that's going to happen, that's like letting the guy loose in Private Ryan. That ain't going to happen. You know. I wanted to give him a taste of what boot camp would be like, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well. Mm -hmm. And that does it. Yeah. Well, that boot camp. Well. Uh, yeah, so it, it was it was fun, you know. So, you know, my my son was in the acting business, and he's still in it, but he's never got that breakout role, right? And you know, there's stories of of actors that don't get it until well, he has to. And my only advice to them is, you got to create it yourself. Yeah, you know, um, do a play like Jazz was Palminteri. He was sleeping on my couch for a while, but then he wrote a play that everybody came to. Hmm. And you take off. So, and even that, I think, is harder for younger people than it was when I started. Um, I know I did Mario Van Peoples' first movie. We had to shoot on the weekends. It was the only way we could get a generator truck. We had to do the cables, the actors. Mm -hmm. He literally robbed the camera from his dad, who was a famous director, and we'd set up, and it took us forever. But in that year, there were only 20 independent films. Hmm. So they were all seen. Now, Toronto Film Festival just had 1,200 independent sure. films because everybody can do it. So the new technology, the good thing is you can make a movie. Mm -hmm. That is The bad true. thing is everybody can make a movie. So God <laughs> knows what gem is not being seen because you just don't have enough time to go through them. So what are the ones that are being seen? The ones that... Maybe have no money, but 
can get some kind of celebrities in. I am const. I'm doing another one next, not next week, the week after, uh, for friends. Okay. You know, and I try to get other people like Tony Dennison is going to join me on this one. We're just helping out some young people because we know nobody's going to watch it unless he gets some kind of name. Sure. Sure. So, but that kind of negates what independents are about. You don't, you're not supposed to be having names. You're not supposed, you know, it's just supposed to be a good story told well. Now we're making it more than that. And I tell him, you cut up my scenes, I'm going to come after you with a <laughs> nine iron. You know, I, you, you got to convince these young directors that you cannot make the movie in an editing machine. You have to tell a story. And and the young actors, not to give up on their dreams. If that's really their passion and their dreams, you got to go make it happen. Yeah. And, um, and when I see a young actor on his phone while they're setting up cameras and not running his lines. Yeah. That, not into uh, it. Um, that just, I can hear Charlie Durning's voice and Jack Clubman. What are they doing? What's the matter? Wow. Oh, they're going to edit it anyway. That's their problem. Mm -hmm. Why are we, why do you care? Let's do our scene. Let's make the crew. There's always an audience. The crew is the, I'll True. tell you, no wonder yours. Steve Confer, our cinematographer, is <laughs> a great guy. And Albert, the guy we're replacing. Um, they had a thing that they were, they would, they were not only the cinematographer, they would be the camera operator. And when we would do a scene, you know, that master, when they said cut, if they got off the camera, that was the greatest compliment you could get. Oh, an right. Actor. That meant it was good. Huh. Now, of course, they'd call them back and do it again, and they'd just, no, nah, they don't really need it, you know. Uh -huh. But you, the crew, these guys have been around, and they love to see a good scene, something that makes them laugh inside or cry. We've lost all that with this. Let me say that line again. Let me say that line again. Over and over. Yeah, it's a whole different world. So that's what's hurting your son. If he can act, it's hard for him to compete when they don't care about acting. Mm. So I think the younger people had a lot harder than I did. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of rejection, a whole lot. Always was, yep. but usually talent would get through. But now... Uh, and it's easy. It's, it's, it's interesting that you say that because it's even easier now than... Back before there was social media and everything else, right? You had to have talent. Yeah. You know? Well, we did plays. You did the plays. 90% of people of my generation, we all did theater. There are very few of the older actors, the great ones who didn't come from the theater. You'd be surprised. Robert Mitchum, I knew him. Uh, Charlie Durning would go to his house. He did theater. People didn't even realize. Yeah. I mean, there were a few. Gary Cooper wasn't a theater person. Yeah. You know, but uh, all of them came from the theater. Yeah, nowadays, there's none of that out no. here in L.A. Why? You're only going to do one line at a time. You're going to do it 80 <laughs> freaking times. So uh, I guess uh, I, I saw a video of you doing a TikTok uh, dance recently. Oh, my <laughs> friend made me do that for... Uh, I got to live through that one again. Okay. You're a TikTok star. I can't dance. I can't dance. <laughs> You think that's what you're hearing me try to sing. Uh, well, it's funny that you say that, but you've got a musical, right? That's right. I did a Broadway musical, so See? don't laugh too hard. Don't laugh too I hard. Of course, I didn't sing a note. I was the narrator, <laughs> but the uh, first day of rehearsal, John Randall, great director, he said, Dan, you got to come in on an eight count. I said, count slower. I don't know. <laughs> I said, when that little girl walks up stage, I'm walking on, you know? <laughs> Well, I appreciate you coming down here to speak with me. It means so much. Uh, uh, anytime. Dan. And you got my number. Come on over You're with your son. We're watching an old movie. I would Maybe love we can get him into that. directing and you can direct his own. I would love to do that. Yeah. yeah. When you when you open the house up again and start doing the we'll movie We'll call me. Three of us can just okay. Let's we'll grab a pizza and watch it. All right. And and what's the, the the like something that you're working on? Anything you're passionate, what you're working on right now? Well, I'm... Uh, Monday, I'm going to Durango Play Fest, okay. which Wendy Malik and I started. And then the week after, I'm going to work on this. It's a pilot, but, you know, it's young kids. I don't know how they think they're going to sell it after we make it. It's actually not that bad. Okay. And then at the end of September, I'm supposed to do a play at St. Clemens Church in New York 
uh, with Judith Ivey and Holland Taylor and uh, who else? John Rubenstein. Okay. Yeah. So we're trying to get people to come back into New York. I'm, I hope that's going to happen. It's, I don't really like doing revivals, but in this case, I'm doing it. And then I have a play that I've written that's been optioned. And a couple of theaters want to do it, not in New York, but around New York. So hopefully we can get that to New York. Okay. Well, let me know. Yeah. I'd love to take the kids. Yeah. I would say, it. you know, mm -hmm. you just, like Charles Durning said, the, I asked, you know, when a young actor asked Charles Durning for advice, he said, there's a couple of things you have to do. One, you work out every day. Now, as heavy as Charlie was, he never smoked, he never drank. He could go forever. He could dance like you wouldn't believe. Mm hmm. You should read aloud, at least a half hour. He would always say, I do it when I'm on the throne, but uh -huh. you should read aloud. Sure. And third, watch an old movie. If any day you're not working, watch an old movie. Watch them over and over again. I, I can't tell you, I, I do never, I never auditioned for a comedy without watching His Girl Friday. I never auditioned for a drama without watching Requiem for a Heavyweight, which we watched that yeah. night. And if I have to play a villain, I watch the original uh, Cape Fear. Huh. And the last thing he would say is, don't ever grow up. If you're not excited about your next audition, I hate acting. I don't like to audition. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't like self tapes, but I love going in a room and audition. Yeah. Now, you know why? Because I'm not auditioning. I get to act for five minutes. They don't want to hire me. That's their that, loss. That's not right. Mine. You always got to maintain that attitude. I don't care how old I am. I'm looking forward to the next play I'm going to be doing. I love it. Yeah. It's a great way to look at life, man. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much. And I look forward to being uh, coming to your house and doing movie oh, nights. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This has been the Jason Hennessy Podcast. This show has been produced by Whitney Welsh engineered and edited by Josh Fisher, and recorded at Hennessy Studios. Please be sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.